Part 1. You will hear a radio announcer giving details of the evening's broadcast programmes. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. The time is 6.55 on Thursday, October the 15th. And now here is a brief review of this evening's programmes on Radio 6. Starting in just a few minutes at 7 o'clock, we have the first programme in our new series, Animal Talk, a documentary with Laura Martins and Jeff Burns. And I'll be telling you some more about that in a minute. Then at 7.50 there will be a broadcast on behalf of the Rare Species Protection Group, telling you about some of the work they're doing to preserve endangered species. This will be followed at 8 o'clock by today's episode of Park Square, our drama series following the fortunes of a close-knit community in North London, in which Sunita begins to wonder if Carl has been telling her the truth, and Carl gets into trouble when a private email is read by the wrong person. At 8.30, we have our phone-in programme, What's Your View? Today's topic is the impact of the media, and you are invited to call in with your own views and questions on this topic. If you have a question for the panel, the number to call is 0207 815 422. This will be followed at 9 o'clock by news and weather, and then at the new time of 9.20, we have our Book of the Week, read by Graham Stanish. This week's book is a collection of Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories, which the author wrote for his children at the beginning of the 20th century and which are now enjoyed by children and adults alike. This evening's story, entitled How the First Letter Was Written, is an imaginary account of the events that led to the invention of writing involving a young girl called Taffy and a series of misunderstandings that arise when Taffy sends the first written message in the history of the world. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And now, some more information about our major new documentary series, Animal Talk, which explores the fascinating area of animal communication. Tonight's programme compares the communication systems used by two of the world's largest creatures, the killer whale and the elephant. Although these might seem like very different creatures, in fact, there are a lot of similarities between them. They're both mammals, they both live in groups, and the social bonds they form are extremely strong. For example, when a new elephant is born, the others in the group will all gather round to greet it. They also live for a long time, like humans, and their brains are very large, which means that there may be room for something in there that allows them to process some type of language. In the programme... Laura Martins, who has spent many years studying the communication systems of whales, describes how although whales do have very good sight, like humans they mostly use sound to communicate. In the case of whales, this is because this travels well in water, where visibility may be limited. In the programme, you'll hear underwater recordings of the whale calls, but what we don't know yet is whether the whales are talking to one another or whether the sounds are just to allow them to identify one another. Also speaking on the programme is Dr Jeff Burns, who has made a special study of elephant communication. Elephants use all their senses to communicate, but as Dr Jeff Burns explains, one way we are only just beginning to find out about is what has been referred to as silent singing. Sounds produced by elephants which are too low for humans to hear, but can be heard by other elephants. And did you know that another way in which elephants can hear is with their feet? 
So, when one elephant stamps on the ground, maybe to warn about danger, the sound travels through the ground, and another elephant up to 30 kilometers away may pick it up. To find out more about exactly how they do this, stay tuned to Radio 6 for Animal Talk. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some information about trips to New Zealand. Uh, certainly. Take a seat and I'll be right with you. Thanks. Now, where would you like to go in New Zealand? Well, I was hoping to do a bit of travelling around, actually. There are a few things I'd like to see and do before I go back home. Right. One thing I really want to do is go to Christchurch. I have relatives living there that I can stay with, my mother's cousin, and I've heard it's a nice place. Yes, it's a lovely city, and staying with relatives will help with the budget, of course. The budget? It will save you some money. Oh, right. Well, I'm not too worried about that. I've saved quite a bit of money working in Australia. Oh, that's nice. Good for you. Uh, well, you know that New Zealand consists of two main islands, the North Island and the South Island, and Christchurch is on the South Island. Is it? I was never very good at geography at school. <laughs> Do you have a map I could look at? Uh, sure. Uh, here we are. Right, I see. And, well, then I'd also like to spend some time in Auckland, and maybe I could do an English language course there. Can you organise that sort of thing for me? Oh, certainly. We'd be happy to arrange that. Uh, but bear in mind that Auckland is in the North Island. OK. And I'd also like to do some skiing or maybe even some snowboarding. I hear New Zealand is a great place for that. Yes, absolutely. But... Uh, you should go to Auckland first for your studies and then you can get the ferry across to the South Island and take the bus down to the snow. Oh, I don't like boats very much. <laughs> I'm not much of a sailor. I think I'd prefer to fly. <laughs> right. Um, what about joining a walking tour? That could be really fun. Not sure about walking, but... Joining a tour might be a good way to travel because then I might make some friends my own age. Now, let's get some details. Uh, can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Su Ming Li, but you can call me Sue. <laughs> OK, Sue. And what's your address here in Melbourne? I'm living with my aunt in the suburb of Kew. It's 29 Lock Street. That's L-O-C-H, not L-O-C-K. Do you have a phone number that I can get you on? The best thing would be if I give you my mobile. I always have it on me. It's 0402 558 992. OK. And uh, when do you want to travel? Because you'll need to be down south in July or August. 
Oh, yes, of course. That's winter, isn't it? So I better go to Auckland in May. Yes, let's say、um, departing from Melbourne on the 1st of May. That's a Saturday.、Mm. And then you could begin your course on Monday the 3rd. That sounds great. And how long would you like to study for?、Um, a month, two, three? What do you think? Well, I'll probably need more than a month.、Uh, what about eight weeks until the end of June? Fine. I'll see what I can do. Oh, and、uh, how would you like to pay for this? On my visa card, if that's possible. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Hello, Sue. It's Angelo from Cosmos Travel here. I've booked your flight and I've found you an English college called the Harbour Language Centre. Great. Where exactly is that?、Uh, well, have you got that little map I gave you yesterday?、Uh, yes. You see where the harbour is with the three wharves and the water? Yes. Got that. OK. a y There are two parallel streets Key Street. That's Q U A Y and Custom Street. The building where the college is located is on Key Street, opposite Prince's Wharf. Right. Got it. And what about accommodation? Well, I've booked you into a hotel for the first three nights, and then the accommodation officer will find you a family to live with. Good. And where's the hotel? It's a short walk from the college on the corner of Queen Street and City Road. Which corner exactly? On the left hand side as we're looking at the map. OK, a y near the little park. Yes, that's right. And what about a good bookshop? I'm going to need to buy a dictionary and some English books. Yes, well, I believe there's a really good language bookshop on the corner of Customs Street and Queen Street. It's near the college, so that's pretty convenient. Thank you so much. You've been really helpful. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman called Phoebe, who is training to be a teacher, talking to her tutor called Tony about research she has done in the school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how did you get on with your school based research, Phoebe? Well, it was exhausting, but really valuable. Good. What was the specific focus you chose? My title is Attitudes Towards Study Among 11 to 12 Year Old Pupils. Right, and what made you choose that focus? Well, <laughs> 
That's a bit difficult. Lots of my classmates decided on their focus really early on, mainly on the basis of what they thought would help in their future career, you know, in their first year's teaching. So that's what helped you decide? Actually, it was that I came across a book written by experienced teachers on student attitudes, and that motivated me to go for the topic. OK. So what were your research questions or issues? Well, I wanted to look at the ways students responded to different teachers, particularly focusing on whether very strict teachers made teenagers less motivated. And from your research, did you find that was true? No, not from what I saw, you know, from my five days observation, talking to people and so forth. OK. We'll talk about the actual research methods in a moment, but before that, can you briefly summarise what your most striking findings are? Well, what really amazed me was the significant gender differences. I didn't set out to focus on that, but I found that boys were much more positive about being at school. Girls were more impatient. They talked a lot about wanting to grow up and leave school. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. From doing the research, it was clear to me that you might start out to focus on one thing, but you pick up lots of unexpected insights. Right. Did you get any insights into teaching? Yes, certainly. I was doing a lot of observations of the way kids with very different abilities collaborate on certain tasks, you know, help each other. And I began to realise that the lessons were developing in really unexpected ways. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I know it's necessary for teachers to prepare lessons carefully, but it's great if they also allow lessons to go their own ways. Good point. Now, I'm really pleased to see you doing this. Analysing and drawing conclusions based on data. But surely this isn't proper data. Because it's derived from such small-scale research. Well, as long as you don't make grand claims for your findings, this data is entirely valid. Mm. I like the way you're already stepping back from the experience and thinking about what you've learned about research. Well done. But I know I could have done it better. As you become more experienced, you'll find ways to reduce the risk of difficulties. OK. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, let's look in more detail at how you gathered your data. Let's start with lesson observation. Well, it generally went quite smoothly. I chose my focus and designed my checklist. Then teachers allowed me into their classes without any problems, which surprised me. It was afterwards that the gruelling work started. Yeah, it's very time-consuming, isn't it? making sense of analysing your observation notes. Absolutely. Much more so than interview data, for example. That was relatively easy to process, though I wanted to make sure I used a high-quality recorder to make transcription easier. And I had to wait until one became available. Right. And did you interview some kids as well? In the end, yes. I talked to ten, and they were great. I'd imagined I'd be bored listening to them, but... So it was easy to concentrate? Sure. One of the teachers was a bit worried about the ethics, you know, whether it was right to interview young pupils, and it took a while for him to agree to let me talk to three of the kids in his class, but he relented in the end. Good. What other methods did you use? I experimented with questionnaires, but I really regret that now. I decided to share the work with another student, but we had such different agendas it ended up taking twice as long. That's a shame. It might be worth you reflecting on ways you might improve on that for future projects. You're right, yeah. OK. And the other thing I did was stills photography. I didn't take as many pictures as I'd hoped to. Lack of time? It's pretty easy just snapping away, but I wanted each snap to have a purpose, you know, that would contribute to my research aims, and I found that difficult. 
Well, that's understandable, but remember... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the continuation of the lecture about the human brain. Look at the diagram before you listen. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. OK, we have looked at the top view of the brain and seen how it is divided into lobes. Now we are going to look at a more complex diagram of the centre of the brain. I will briefly go through some of the important parts that make up the brain and then talk more about what each does. First of all, you can see that by far the largest part of the brain is the cerebrum and it is made up of the three lobes we have already talked about. The lobe below, coloured yellow on the diagram here, is the cerebellum. Right in the centre of the brain here is the thalamus. The hypothalamus is part of it but it has a slightly different function now here, running down from the centre of the brain, is the brain stem. It is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, and is connected to the spinal cord, which you can see here at the bottom of the diagram. Now, finally, this little gland just to the left of the midbrain, it looks like a little tail, is the pituitary gland. OK, let's go back and say something about the function of the various parts of the brain. The cerebrum, the largest part, as we have said, has two halves or hemispheres. I will talk more about the difference between the two hemispheres later. The cerebrum is the part of the brain that is really our intelligence. It controls voluntary movement that is, movement that we are in control of, speaking, for example. But it is also responsible for our emotional thinking and memory. The cerebellum is responsible for fine movement and coordination. It helps us with balance, for example, and to understand where we are. In relation to space around us, the thalamus here in the centre, processes what we feel with our body, touch and temperature, for example, and controls how we react to those senses. The hypothalamus has a similar function, but regulates bodily needs, such as hunger and thirst, and tells us when we need sleep. Now, at the top of the brain stem is the midbrain, this is a sort of switchboard, a very complex switchboard. It sends messages which help the brain communicate with other parts of the nervous system. The pons in the middle of the brain stem here 
sends messages from the cerebrum to the cerebellum and spinal cord. The medulla oblongata is here just above the spinal cord. It regulates essential bodily functions, like breathing and the rate of our heartbeat. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system and runs down inside the spinal column. It connects the brain to nerves that go to the rest of the body. Now, the pituitary gland, this little gland, has a hugely important function. It releases hormones to the body that regulate all sorts of things. How quickly we grow, and the size we grow to, the rate at which we age. It also regulates whether we have a slow or fast metabolism and how we relate to stress. Now I am going to show you a model of the human brain and I want you to identify... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.